This episode of Bass Freaks is brought to you by Dunlop Bass Strings. Dunlop Bass Strings are made in California and designed by the players of Dunlop to sound and feel the way a string should. With deep lows, strong fundamental punchy mids, and articulate highs. Dunlop Bass Strings offer a complete line with standard nickel and stainless round wounds, flat wounds, and super brights. They're also available in short, medium, and long scales. So go to jimdunlop.com and check out Dunlop Bass Strings. What's up, my friends? Welcome to Dunlop Presents Bass Freaks, the place for all us bass freaks to chat it up and gain a little insight and inspiration and have some fun. And today we are going to have some fun. We have a very special guest, old friend of mine from way, way, way back high school days, Eva Gardner in the house. Raise the roof. Big round of applause. How are you? Hey, what's up, Josh? It's great to see you. It's so good to see you. We went to high school together. Um, many moons ago, mm-hmm. Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. And that's, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago. How have you been? What have you been doing since then? Gosh, um, <laughs> where do I start? Um, I have been great. I've been great. I mean, we're both still doing the same thing we did in high school. You know, yeah. like it was, it was an arts high school and we were both in the music program playing bass. And... We're still you were doing awesome it. then, by the way, too. So thank you, thank you. Likewise, still, still awesome. Um, I remember doing. I remember doing some jamming with you. Oh yeah, that Back was a day. That was so much fun. What was this? The exploration of music and being around so many other musicians our age. Mm-hmm. It was a great experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It really. Pu- I feel like it really pushed. It pushed me. You know, being around other people that just were just light years ahead of me and just so much better and then sitting in those situations that really pushes you to make you better right so it was at that school that I really really took bass playing to another level music to another level and and um really catapulted from there so um happy I had that experience let's start even earlier than that let's go way back I mean like diapers days <laughs> tell me tell me where you're from and um, I know you're from a musical family so you want to talk about that a little bit yes so I am from Los Angeles California and uh, my father was actually a bass player I'm a second generation bassist but he was from London he's from uh, over that scene um, swing in 60s in London and um, was in his first band with Ron Wood they lived in the same neighborhood um, called the birds the British birds and Later went on to play in the creation, um, opening up for the Rolling Stones in 1967. Uh, they, he was good friends with the guys from the Who. They did all their early shows together and recorded with, um, you know, Eric Clapton, George Harrison. He was just in that scene back in the day when they all started as teenagers again, right? Like, except a lot of them, like my dad didn't finish high school. <laughs> he dropped out of high school and hit the road, and that's what they were doing back then. So um, I I grew up hearing all of those stories and being around all of those people. Um, dad moved to LA in the 70s. His, da- his band was signed to Capitol Records and um, ended up moving out to LA and staying um, and uh, opened up a pub in Hollywood called The Cat and Fiddle. That, and was, was, a, that it was the spot. Yeah, right? where, yeah. yeah. And um, it's still around. And um, I mean, I grew up there in a British pub around a bunch of rock and rollers, a bunch of musicians and hearing the stories. And I knew that's what I wanted to do, too. Was that one of those? Was there any moment in particular that you were like, you know what, this is what I'm doing? You know, it's funny when I was I was telling the story the other day when I was seven years old, I had a slumber party. Um, and me and my little girlfriends were all hanging out in my dad's studio. And I told them, I said, I'm going to be, I'm a, no, I didn't even say I'm going to be, I was like, I'm a bass player. <laughs> and I didn't even, I didn't even really know what that meant, but I was like surrounded by all my dad's instruments. And I lifted one of his basses and kind of dragged it across the room because I it was too heavy for me to carry at the time. But right. I just knew that that's what I was going to do. And, um, and it wasn't until later that I actually started to look into taking it more seriously. But it's something that I always just knew was going to happen for me and what I wanted. And um, and just being around it, I just absorbed all of it and and loved it. It was just in my, you know, in my bones. 
in your blood and bones. Mm-hmm. Being exposed mm-hmm. to that at an early age is, I think, really important. Um, what was the what was the vibe musically around your house growing up? Oh my God, um, musically. I mean, I look back now and and I'm like, oh, that was Mick Taylor in our living room playing guitar. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, but when I was a kid, I was like, oh my God, these are just all my dad's lunatic friends, you know, like John and Whistle lived down the, the street from us. So, you know, dad was hanging out with him all the time. And um, so I was just surrounded by all these in, incredible folks. Like he was still really close with Ron Wood. So we would always see him when he was in town or when I was over in the UK. Um, so I was just around all these legendary people, um, but didn't appreciate the gravity of who they were at the time. Cause again, you're a young kid. That's just Ron. It's yeah, it's yeah, exactly. John, um, Ron, all John, of them. John, Ron, Andy, uh, Uncle Just, Andy, Andy, he, Andy Johns was a fixture for us. Wow. Um, so you know, he was literally like Uncle Andy, and he was actually the one who gave me my first lesson. Really? Mm-hmm. How old were you? I was. It was. Uh, gosh, he just finished Van Halen's live record. Um, so I think it was like ninety three. And I was like begging my dad to let me borrow a bass. And I was like, come on, I want to practice. And he wasn't having it. It was super weird. He wasn't into the idea <laughs> at all. He was like, don't touch my stuff. Wow. Okay. And he, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm sure there are a few reasons why he wasn't into the idea of his little girl becoming a musician. Yeah. Um, yeah. I get but, that. Yeah. Um, but it was Uncle Andy, Andy Johns, knocking on the door one day and showing up with a 1960s Gibson EB3 bass and a little pig nose amp and he was like i think dad was like oh cool you brought me some gear to check out and he's like no <laughs> ah that's amazing <laughs> it's time to sit eat little eva down and give her a lesson she's been talking about it for ages and it wasn't until he sat me down andy john sat me down and and um actually put on the van halen, van halen live record that he had just finished and um put on their version of you really got me and uh, and that was the first bass line I learned. That is so awesome. I mean, really epic. I love that. I, I didn't know that, actually. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Is, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. So it was the EB3, right? Mm-hmm. That was your first bass. Where'd you go from there? I, well, I borrowed Andy's bass. That was his. Okay. Um, and so that was just temporary alone. And I just borrowed basses for a long time because dad wouldn't buy me my own. Like, I I I look back now and I'm grateful that he made me work my ass off for it because I had to really prove that it's what I wanted to do. It wasn't just hand it to me, you know, like you can use any bass in the castle. It's it <laughs> was definitely not like that at all. It's like don't even look at them. <laughs> you gotta work for it. That's cool. Don't even look at my shit. Um, so uh, yeah, I borrowed. Um, eventually when I finally started like I was like hey dad like I have I have a band now like I was in my first band and what was it called we were called Entropy and Mm. at the time before I went to Loxa I was I went to Macklin Heart which was an all-girl Catholic school what in Los Feliz and I was a freshman and these juniors were looking for a for a bass player and uh, I was I remember I was in biology class and the three of them like walk up to the table like a like a you know super gangster, and I'm like, oh my god, these are juniors <laughs> coming up to me. What's what do they want with me? <laughs> I'm so scared. <laughs> they're like, they- we, hear you, we hear you're playing bass. Like Mean Girls. Kind of like Mean Girls, but they're super nice. Um, okay. Yeah, and and we ended up uh, being in a band together. So I had a, a gig booked in Glendale at a coffee shop called Stage Left. Nice. And uh, Dad was like, okay, I guess you need to actually like have something to practice on. So I borrowed, he let me borrow one of his old carbons, carvins. He was endorsed by Carvin in the early eighties. Okay. Active or uh, passive? It was, remember? um, it was passive. Okay. But it was heavy, 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 heavy. And then those old cases, those hard cases that come with them. Yeah. So I had the base with the case and I'm in my little Catholic school girl uniform, like climbing up the stairs to, you know, liturgy practice or whatever I was doing at the time and, um, lugging that thing around. So I played that for a long time. Wow. What are you playing now? Uh, I play Fender, Fender Precisions. That was all I ever wanted, man. I just like... Well, I remember in school, that's what you were playing as well. You had the the P-Bass. Yes, I had the P-Bass that I had finally got 
So when I was 15, my we would always write cards for Santa. You know, even when we were older, it was like my mom's way of letting it, um, you know, we can let her know what we want for Christmas. She's like, gotcha. be your Santa. <laughs> so my sister asked for a guitar and I don't remember what I asked for. Probably something stupid. Like, I don't know, some new Converse or something. And um, so come Christmas Day, there's a guitar case under the tree. And I was like, cool, my sister got her guitar. That's awesome. And my dad was like, well, did you actually look at the tag on it? I said, no. And I went over and it was said to Eva, love mom and dad. And inside of it was a precision. Amazing. I finally, it was like I earned my stripes. You know, I was like, I finally got, finally got this bass that, I, that I'd wanted. Is that in high me, school? What's that? In high school? That was in high school. Yeah. And me awesome. being like a little jerk, I was like, oh, but it's not a vintage one. <laughs> <laughs> So I was just like in awe of all of like my, my dad and their friends and their cool vintage gear, you know, yeah. their 60s stuff that they bought new in 1962. And um, but now I'm like, well, no, it's basically vintage now. And every nick and scratch on that thing is mine. It's been all around the world with me. And um, he knew what he was doing. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with dad there. Yeah. Um, are you still playing that bass? I am. It's actually right behind me. Let me see it. Where is it? Move my mic. Oh, let me see. That black on, one. One second. All right, there it is. Yep. Tell me about it. So it's a 90s P bass, um, a Mexican P bass, interestingly. And so I went down to Sunset Boulevard. You know where the guitar center is down there? And there are all the guitar shops in Hollywood. Yeah. So uh, I went down to the guitar shops and I like... I bought a pick guard and I bought some chrome knobs and I bought some like cool pickups and basically like worked on my bass. I brought a uh, bought a brass nut and just kind of worked on it and made it my own. And, Did you do that all of that yourself? Uh, I, I had my dad help me with some of it, cool. but for the most part, I yeah, I just like totally like operated on on my instrument. Um, I had to help him. He had to help me like change strings and stuff. He taught me how to do all those things. But I was like, I know how to screwdriver, use a screwdriver, and these are screws. Cool. So I just took it apart and made it my own, you know, because it was like a stock. It was a stock P, you know, with like the plastic knobs and and uh, the lower end model, right? Because uh, yeah. um, yeah. that's you know, what do you get your the first base for your kit, right? That you don't know if they're serious or not about it. They're not, you know, usually they're not going to go out and get the highest end thing. But Ride their I made bike it over it. What's that? Ride the bike over it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or use it as a, I don't know, whatever. Surfboard. Um, a prop Any, or something. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I made it my own. And I, I like, like I said, I mean, it's been all over the world and it like, it's my favorite base to record with. Like it always, for whatever reason, um, engineers love it. Just the way, the way it sounds. And, you know, there's, there's just some instruments that just have a, have a thing. And, yeah, they definitely um, so, do. It's a good one, and um, it's it's one of my one of my go tos for sure. Awesome, so, I love that's the that. one and I use all through high school. At Loxa, sitting in jazz band, like that. Yeah, was the, it sounded so fat too. Stuff. And I always thought, actually, I was like, I bet she got that from her dad because <laughs> <laughs> that bass sounds so cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, what? Uh, let's see. So from high school. Um, Really? So you got your first lesson, but did your dad help you out or, or did you take more lessons in between? So he could only help me out so much because he wasn't a schooled guy. Um, and, you know, interestingly, here's a fun fact. I actually failed my audition to get into Loxa. What? Yeah, I didn't get in because, you know, I didn't have the right answers. Like I had like, a more like rebellious attitude back then. I was like, well, my dad didn't learn how to read music and Jimi Hendrix doesn't learn how to read music. So I'm in the audition and they're like, can you read the notes on the board? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? I, I couldn't do it either. Yeah. So, well, yeah. you got in. <laughs> yeah, We both did. Here yeah, we, we are. We both did. But I, but I actually, so at that point, I got a teacher and I was like, okay, well, a light bulb went off and I was like, oh, if I got to, if I'm bending the rules, I got to learn them first kind of a thing. So, um, so I tried again a second time and I auditioned again and I got in. So, um, so I ended up going with like, a, like teachers that weren't my dad because he could only get me so far. I had to learn all the, like, um, you know, I was like learning Bach and 
stuff like that. Theory so, and different. Yeah. Yeah. Just taking to a different level. So I was doing the lessons and then, um, and then after LOX, I went to UCLA. That's for right. Ethnomusicology. And how was, did, uh, did you graduate? I did. Okay. I didn't remember if you actually yeah, went all the I way finished. through you started touring. Yeah. I finished, I finished school, but you know, it's funny. I was getting tour offers while I was at school and yeah, cause you're awesome. Thank you. And, but for some reason I decided to stay in school. I just wanted to finish. I felt like I just wanted to hang tight and get this degree, even though it doesn't mean a whole lot, but to me, it meant a lot. I was the first person in my family to finish college. So, um, yeah, so it's it meant a, huge... a lot to me and I hit the road pretty much right after I finished. So tell me about one of the offers that you got that you had to turn down. I don't, I don't even remember, to be honest. Like, I feel like obviously it wasn't that amazing of an offer for, for me to throw take away it, college. Right? Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I feel like if something would have come through that would have been like, whoa, there's no way I can say no to this. Yeah. I, I might have, but um, yeah, I don't really remember. I remember. The journey. The journey. the journey. Yes. So your first like pro pro gig, what was it? Um, I would say my first tour. Yes, when I finished college, I hit the road, and that was with the Mars Volta. That's right. Mm -hmm. How was that I, experience? It was amazing. I was. It was one of those things where okay, learn all the rules, and then I can throw them all out the window now. And it just <laughs> became like, oh, this is why we're doing this, right? Like we're writing from just from from the heart and we're antennas basically right and just did you write with them as well yeah we did awesome. we we're all in a room together and coming up with band names together it was like right when it was all forming okay so um and it actually uh yeah it was like right at the at the genesis of the band so how long did you do that a couple years nice and you guys mm -hmm. toured we toured yeah yeah, and it was my first because um, normally I was at school in the fall, and uh -huh. so that fall right after I finished school, I was on the road with those guys, and we were on the East Coast, and it was the first autumn I had ever seen in my life. Because growing oh, so, up in that's LA, right. Los right? Angeles, and I was like, right. oh that, my yeah. god, this is just like the movies. I was completely starstruck <laughs> by the season of autumn. <laughs> we, were, we were like a college town, and the leaves were turning all beautiful colors, and I was completely starstruck. Oh, you get to see so much on tour. You know, uh, yeah. there are things you don't get to see a lot, but I remember seeing my first Firefly on tour as oh, a teenager. Oh, in the South? Yeah, I think we were somewhere in the South, and I I thought they were just in movies, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, when I first, everybody laughed at me, of course, but... Um, You're you like, know, whoa! This is, you... that's real? Oh, my God. <laughs> exactly. Ah, the little things. The little <laughs> things. You know, when you grow up in the, you know, in California... LA like yeah. there's other there's other things that we don't have here <laughs> lots yes. of things there, there are a lot of things <laughs> um so from that first gig to where you are now you've done a bunch of things in between um in between that you did did you Farouk Assault is that mm -hmm. yeah you played with them and mm -hmm. um now with Pink forever it seems like you've been with her forever going on 14 years Congratulations on that. That's Thank a career you. in itself. Yeah, yeah. We're good. It's it's, it's and it's pretty much the same band since I started. Like That's, I'm still one of the new kids in the band. It's it's a great band as well. What would you um, attribute your your longevity in that gig to? Is there any <laughs> any any advice that you can give some players out there? Yeah, I would say. I mean. Being a being a musician, being part of a team, being in a band, it's an all around kind of a thing, right? Like, of course, proficiency on your instrument, that's a given, right? The, being able to like do what it takes to be solid at the gig, learn the songs, be on time, all those things that come with it. But there's also the being a great team member, right? Being easy to work with, being um, just a, a fun personality and someone who's sees things like you know the glass half full <laughs> kind of a thing because who wants to be around doom and gloom all day right yeah true um and it's not just on i mean being on stage when you're on tour being on stage is a very short part of the day it's a very small part like there's what about the rest of the day when you're sharing dressing rooms you're on the 
in the van, on the bus, like you're having meals, you're in the hotel, the travels, all that stuff. Like you're spending a lot of time with these people. So um, you want to be, you want to make that time pleasant, as pleasant as possible. Um, right. And then of course, like work ethic. I mean, work ethic is really important as well and respecting the people around you and why you're there and supporting the other members of the band. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you're all in it together, right? Absolutely. Do you find that there's a huge difference in um, playing for an artist and playing in a band such as Mars Volta, where it was your own? Yeah, there's a, there's a huge difference. Um, I mean, when I was in in that band, um, it was a collabor- it was a collaborative thing, right? And you're all contributing. Um, you're all up, you know, staying up till two, three, four in the morning, jamming, you know, working on songs and and doing the collaboration thing. Um, when you're playing for an artist, um, they use the term hired gun. It's it's definitely a, a different thing. You're there to um, support the artist. And you're there to make them look good and sound good. And um, and that comes with like learning their songs and pretty much doing your part to um, do what it takes to, you know, do the thing. Sometimes you're a little bit of a chameleon, you know what I mean? You're learning the songs and you're like, oh, cool. This, okay, this is played with a pick. Cool. Get out your pick and whatever pedals you need to make it sound like the record that they want you to sound like. Sometimes it's thumb style, whatever. So you're a little bit of a chameleon in situations like that. And you want to be able to tell them the MD, like, sure, no problem. I got this, whatever you need, you know? Right. Do you get to insert yourself at all into any of that after all these years? Um, I mean, I mean, somewhat, you know, I think if you're, if you're up there on stage, you're already inserting yourself just by Correct. being there and it's yeah. your, and your presence. Do you, uh, do you, well, do you get to, re- do you record with her at all? No. No. Okay. No. So yeah, the tour, there's like the touring band, the light band, and then the studio scenario with hers. It's her right. own thing. Okay. Yeah. It changes quite a bit on, you know, gig to gig. So, um, exactly. Do you get to throw in anything, you know, kind of fancy, your own little thing, improvise a little bit while you're out there playing? There's not a whole lot of room, to be honest. I think like the most, I mean, when we, we played My Generation for one tour, and uh, which has that cool, um, the Who song, you know, it has a yeah. cool little bass. So I was like, sweet, I get a, <laughs> I get a bit. This is awesome. Um, so that was super fun. But as far as like otherwise, I mean, I get to during rehearsals, there was, um, you know, a lot of the stuff's played on, on key bass. So there's a lot uh-huh. of keyboards or whatever. So um, there was one song where I was like, cool, how about like a bowed upright on this part? So like I had my upright with me, I had the bow, like, we, we auditioned it, the MD loved it. And I was like, sweet, I get to do this on this song. So there's a little bit of like figuring out how I can recreate the part and make it sound um, best in a live situation. Cause a lot of times when you take a studio record and you're implementing it in a live setting, how do you recreate that? And how do you, how do you best make it sound for that live situation? You know? So there's some of that. Cool. I always, I, I love records. This is just me personally. But when I go to see a band or an artist, I do like to see them step it up a bit. I'd like mm-hmm. to see the live version of the tunes. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, totally. The, energy, the energy. It's the Yeah, drive. the energy that is, is brought um, inspires me. So that's cool to hear that you can, you know, throw in a few things and you're they're open to your suggestions and mm-hmm. trust you enough. What uh, What kind of amps are you using? I use Ampeg amps. Um, on tour, I use the good old SVT 810. <laughs> the workhorse. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the workhorse. Um, I love the SVT VR that they do. It's the newer version of the vintage. Oh, cool. Um, um, you know, the good old SVT head. Um, so I love the VR. I love the way that that sounds. Um, and I also use an SVT2 Pro as well which is basically like the old svt head tube all tube, but with some extra bells and whistles like eq and stuff that's the really heavy one yes they're yeah. all they're all <laughs> they're all pretty pretty hefty <laughs> that's awesome what about strings uh roto sound okay it's roto sounds particular gauges and uh, why- standard gauge i like the swing 66s um also for flats i use the jazz 77s how often are you playing flats? Um, I have a bass set up with flats. 
So I'm, um, we'll bring that out if, if I need it. Um, depends on the gig, you know, it depends yeah. on the music. It depends on what's going on. Like if I, if there's a song where that's the vibe, then that's the base for, for that part. Cool. Yeah. What, when you're, um, so now you're not only doing pink, but you have solo records and another one coming out, right? Or is yeah. it, when is that coming? Yes, that is coming. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yes. you. Um, that is coming out within the next couple months. I would awesome. Say. Tell yeah, me about early, it. Early summer. Yeah. So, I mean, I started, I mean, I've always written with bands and I've always been in bands. I've always written songs uh, in a collaborative setting. And uh, when I was on the road a few years ago and just, I was on a two and a half year tour and just a lot of downtime in hotel rooms and days off. I mean, not a ton, but you know, there's, there's enough. So I started traveling with the recording rig and writing and recording songs in my hotel rooms. And then I was like, what should I do with these songs? So I put them out. Um, and I'm just doing, the, I'm doing the same thing. It kind of set me off on this really, really fun trajectory. And um, I just started, you know, got a batch of songs. I had about 15 songs, picked six of them and went to the studio and um, did most of the demoing on my own. And then, uh, you know, have stems, will travel. I, like took my <laughs> stems to, to the studio and had some live drums track over them, redid some vocals with some nice mics. And um, you're singing as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, and writing and playing everything. Writing, or? playing mostly everything except live drums. Yeah, that's great. Super fun. It's yeah. really fun. It's freeing, isn't it, to be able it to is, just create? It is very and do freeing. Things. It is very freeing, and um, it, we haven't been in much of a situation to get into that, you know, the jam room, so to speak. So, um, having the capability just to do all that stuff has has been great. And where technology is at right now is insane. You have a keyboard controller, and then I use Logic, so Me you too. know, you've got a keyboard controller, and you've got all kinds all kinds of sounds, all kinds of stuff going on in there. So it's really fun. What's the uh, what's the vibe of the record? I, so I would say you would definitely know I was listening to K Rock in the nineties. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> that's a good vibe. Yeah, it's definitely it's like poppy, poppy grunge, alternative rock. <laughs> Very cool. Do you have a favorite tune on there? Um. Yeah. I the. I have a, my favorite one right now is it's called call it a day call it a day yeah okay it's the last one. it'll be the last one so uh, yeah cheers last the song cheers. on the record thank you cheers uh what so when you're approaching um songwriting and and in particular bass lines tell me a little bit about your approach uh, obviously it changes from from tune to tune and vibe to vibe but generally when you go in for a session or when you're going in for your own tune how do you do it so for my own process um that varies i mean sometimes i'll be just like messing around on the bass and then i have a bass line and then i build on that sometimes i'm just in logic and i pull up a random loop i'm like oh that's kind of cool and then i'll just i'll build on that sometimes it'll be a vocal melody that I have in, in my head and I'll build on that. So it just depends on what's coming through the ether basically. And gotcha. I'll just pull, pull stuff out and just build, build layer, layer. And then it turns into whatever it's going to turn into. You never know. It's like Mr. Toad's wild ride. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you have, uh, do you have a favorite baseline? Oof. Like you grab a bass and, so, and you just start to play. What do, what do you, find yourself always the gravitating towards. The one that towards. comes to mind right now is Sly, if you want me to stay. Ah, that's like, classic, just, yes. It's just so sick and it's mixed so loud in the song. <laughs> it's like so well, yeah. in your face, bass in your face. And I just, yeah, that one's just always, I always get happy when I hear that. Speaking of bass in your face, um, so this is called Bass Freaks. Mm -hmm. um, are you a bass player, bass enthusiast, or are you a bass freak? Ooh, I mean, freaky, obviously. Okay, good. Me too. I was just curious. <laughs> I know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, I would say, um, definitely that because I was. So I had this memory, like one of my very first memories. 
um, is me being in my crib or my bed or whatever, it's probably about two or three. And I had this teddy bear, a wind up teddy bear that had a music box in it. And I would wind it up and the, and the music box, it has little teeth on it, right? That would play the different, the different notes. Yeah. And I always just heard the bass. It was like, and I always heard boom, boom, boom. And I just heard that all the time. And I felt it like I was laying on it, right? And I could yeah. just feel that, that frequency, the frequency uh -huh. of the of those notes. And it was just uh, earliest memory. Like I was already just hearing and feeling the bass. The freaky That's, frequencies. Yeah, you're pretty much a bass freak, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so many different definitions, so. but yes. Of course. That lands in there. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of your must-haves for tour? Um, like, like just things that I bring, bring with me. Yeah. And to be able to survive out there because it's not always easy. It's not. No. Um, I, I definitely, um, I have a subscription to a, a like a yoga website. Oh, cool. Called Gaia. And that keeps me going on the road. Um, just doing a little bit of something at least just a little bit every day, every other day. On the just reg? Something daily? On the reg. Yeah, cool. it just keeps me going, mind, mind, body, spirit, you know. So the subscription to that definitely is a number one. Um, what else? My recording rig. That's a, that's definitely a go-to now. I always have that. Um, and then, you know, the, the essentials like headphones, good headphones, and, you know, your music. Uh, I do... A good journal. I do morning pages every morning. Oh, really? I write every morning. Yeah. Okay. Start my day with that with the brain dump. So for I was, how long have you been doing that? I've been doing that for like, I got it the idea from the Artist Way, which is a book by Julia Cameron, mm -hmm. and it's about unblocking. And this was a just a just such an invaluable tool that I've I started doing that maybe ten years ago. And um, been doing it off and on since then, but my practice has been pretty solid. Like the, like the last three tours that I've done, you find that it helps really to good. keep your head clear. Yeah, and it just kind of empties out the empties out the the brain dump is what they call it. You know, you right. start your day and and um, you're already in between the, in the sleep and waking time, and before you do anything, before you turn on your phone or do anything like that, you just pen to paper. And you just take out the trash, basically, because you know our our brains become these. Just you know, your the, the thoughts just go back and forth, and they don't go anywhere, and they just kind of fester, and and they don't really help you out. They kind of make you crazy. So if you just get flush all that stuff out, pen to paper, it really helps process a lot of stuff. That's a very, very, very good practice, I would say, especially yeah. out there. Oh, yeah. It seems like all you guys get along. Um, you know, with the pink crew, but there are still times where, you know, um, you feel suffocated or you're around these people 24 seven and you can't really get away very often. Um, what do you do to combat that and be able to deal with it? Yeah. You find your, you find moments you, know, you find moments where you can, you know, you're around people all the time, but I like to take walks before, um, you know, after sound check or whatever during the day, I like to just get out and, and move and just kind of get some air. And, and, um, especially when we do like a lot, a lot of these weird, weird venues overseas, you know, like, Oh, what's, what's going on around this weird, you know, a b stadium in Berlin or whatever it is, you know, you go on and adventures just out explore there, explore and go on an adventure. Yeah. Oh, I'm, cool. I'm all about doing that kind of stuff. Um, and just, yeah, just clearing the head, taking walks, exploring. What's uh, what's one of the coolest places you've ever been on tour? Um, like geographically. Yeah, is there something that you've seen that just really sticks in your mind that you'll never forget? <sighs> there's like, um, gosh, there's so many insane moments. Like one of the ones in particular, like I just said, Berlin, like the Olympic Olympic Stadium in Berlin, where they had the the, the Olympics in the 30s. That was just such a weird, heavy, wild place to be and be performing there, and just knowing the history of what went down there um, was super intense. 
Um, mm -hmm. Also doing like, I mean, I, I played a gig in Macedonia once. Wow. Was that with Pink or was you know, that yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, wow. it was. And it was just such a random, wild place. And I was like, wow, did I ever think I would ever come to Macedonia, let alone play a rad gig here? It was a trip. <laughs> so cool. And lots of cool, Tour lots life. Of cool little Tour interesting life. places. Yeah, it's amazing. We are very fortunate and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm uh, also grateful to have you on here. It's been so long. Mm -hmm. We can't let this go. All this time go by any longer. No, man. We got to hang out soon. <laughs> um, do you use effects at all on your bass? I do some, yeah. When it's when it's called for it um, on the road, I mostly like mostly distortion. I use mostly distortion on the share gig. On share, I was. Well, that's using, right. You played with share as well. Yeah, I was I using some chorus. That. I was using some distortion. I was using. Um, uh, a little bit of envelope filtery stuff here and there. Cool. Yeah. Fuzz or overdrive? What's your favorite? Um, I like a good fuzz, but it's hard to find a good fuzz where the bottom doesn't fall out. Yeah, that's true. Like, there are some it, out there. There are some, and the fuzz can sound super, super great on its own. But as soon as you kick it in, it I find the bottom falls out. What do you like? What's your favorite? I I like a fuzz. Um. I think I prefer an overdrive, mm -hmm. but uh, excuse me. Um, there is the sub octave fuzz, mm -hmm. the bass sub octave fuzz pedal that I use a lot. That Dunlop MXR? makes, yeah, MXR. Yeah, and um, I use that. It's a good one. A lot. Mm -hmm. I I like to rumble the walls. Is that the purple that. one? No, that's a yellow one. Oh, yellow. Okay. And um, I've I've knocked down many of tables with that bad boy nice <laughs> i click that on and clothes fall off that's freaky <laughs> oh my gosh so do you have a favorite drummer oh my god there's so many i know but who's your favorite like to listen to or to play with to play with um i've always loved playing with john theodore oh love, yeah love he's him. awesome love 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 playing with him um, I love playing with Fredo Ortiz, Alfredo. He's um, he's uh, Gogo Bordello, and um, he's doing Los Lobos right now. I just love oh cool his, his feel, and he's got the Latin Latin vibe going on, which I which I also love. It was all those playing all those Latin jazz songs at Loxa, I think. I'm all yeah, about that. <laughs> you were so into that. You were so like, into it. You were deep. I was so in. It was all about the groove, you know, like. Like there's there's two notes, but it's where do those notes fit, right? Exactly. How do they sound? So good. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? Um, I love playing with Mark Schulman as well. Like I've been playing with him for 14 years in the in the Pink Band and the Share Band, and just such a solid powerhouse of a drummer. He is solid. He's a nice mm -hmm. dude too. Very Super cool. nice. Yeah. He's also yeah. he's also like a brother to me too. So it's just an all around like we've done rhythm section tours together. We were doing rhythm section clinics for a while. Really? Yeah. That's and fun. It was so much fun. And Fender hired us to do a rhythm section tour out over in Europe. And we just had the best time just talking about drum and bass and just just uh just having a good time out there on a different kind of a tour. Right. I like those. I like the different mm -hmm. kind of tours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, before we go, uh, any advice on a bass line or bass lines that you think some young players or old players um, might want to learn? <sighs> hmm. Gosh. I mean, it depends on the style that they're into. But um, hey, man, you can't go wrong with Sly. If you want True. me to stay. That's <laughs> True. That is a good one. It's simple. It's it's groovy. Like it's it's about the feel, and it's just so it's so prominent. It's such a prominent part of the song. I agree. High five on that one. Boom. Yeah, man. Boom. Throw it up. Throw it up. Awesome. Oh. Uh, Eva, thank you so much for hanging. I really do appreciate you, and I hope we do get to hang in person sometime soon. How are you holding up um, through the pandemic and and no touring? Yeah, I, I mean, I just decided to see it as an opportunity. Um, and so I 
went back to school. You know, I'm just like getting back into the into learning the production side of stuff and delving into logic even more and um, writing more and just kind of shifting shifting gears and just seeing it as an opportunity to learn some stuff that I might not have time to otherwise. Staying productive and creative. Stay, That's absolutely. key. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from, from the last year that I really kept in mind was you can't, something to the effect of you can't control the circumstances, you can only control your reaction to them. So I've found that to be invaluable advice. I like it's a it. good one. It's yes. a great, great thing to remember in all situ- situations. Where can people find you? You can go to uh, evagardner.com okay. and I'll have all my links to my Instagram and my Facebook and all that stuff from there. That's the, that's the launching pad. What about for your record? Um, Eva Gardner, uh, Spotify, iTunes, all that good stuff. Um, my old record is up now. My new one should be up within the next couple months. Woohoo! Yeah. Can't wait. Thank you. Everybody go out and get that. What's the name of it one more time? Um, it will be called Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Yeah. That's, ooh, so mysterious. My old one, my other one's called Chasing Ghosts. That's up now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you again for doing this. That's our show for today. Thank you all for joining us. Stay healthy and kind. Uh, Spread love, good vibes, and inspiration. And remember, you got this. Follow your path and just play. I'm Josh Paul. I hope to see you all out there sometime soon. And thank you to Dunlop for making this show possible. And be sure to check out Bass Freaks wherever you get your podcasts. Cheers to you.